and welcome to this morning service. Back with the uh, nativity scene, we have just celebrated Epiphany, and so today I'm going to be focusing on our three characters here. The Magi, the Wise Men, whatever term you want to use, the Three Kings, and we will be discussing that a little bit later. But before we do that, let's pray together. Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we come as a people scattered to our homes because we want to worship you. We are scattered in fear because we are worried about catching a disease that though far lethal than last year can still hospitalise and even kill us. We are not terrified, but we are cautious. We prepare our hearts for worship knowing that you are the God who can do all things. And you give us the wisdom to know when to do the brave things and sometimes even the dark things. So we come to you wherever we are, however we feel, whatever our week has been like. And we come to give you glory, we come to worship you. We come to adore you. We come to hear again the promises and challenges of the visit of the three wise men. Christmas tide is now over. Epiphany has been celebrated. And we use these three men to guide us into the coming year. O oh Lord, as they look to the heavens, so do we. We look to you. Take us, lead us, and inspire us for the weeks that lay ahead, we pray. Amen. Here are three videos for the children. When Jesus was born in the village of Bethlehem in Judea, Herod was king. During this time, some wise men from the east came to Jerusalem and said, Where is the child born to be king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And the star they had seen in the east went on ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. They were thrilled and excited to see the star. When the men went into the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother, they knelt down and worshipped him. They took out their gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh and gave them to him. Later, they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod and they went back home by another road. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and have come to worship him. But having heard this, Herod the king was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means the least among the governors of Judah. For out of you shall come a governor who shall shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, precisely inquired of them at what time the star appeared. And sending them to Bethlehem, he said, Go and search earnestly for the young child. And when you have found him, report to me that I also may come and worship him. When they had heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they saw in the east 
went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. Having seen the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they found the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed into their own country by another way. About the time of Jesus' birth, some wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, asking King Herod, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was angered by what he heard. A king other than himself? In his own land? Herod called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote. You, Bethlehem, are one of the smallest towns in Judah, but from you will come one who will rule Israel for me. He comes from very old times, from days long ago. Then King Herod called the wise men back in for a private meeting. He told the wise men, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can worship him too. After listening to the king, the wise men left to follow the star. They arrived at the place where Jesus was, and going into the house they found the promised child and his mother Mary. They gave him offerings of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and were so overjoyed at the fulfillment of God's promise, they bowed before Jesus and worshipped him. That night in a dream, the wise men were warned about returning to King Herod. He was plotting to kill Jesus. When they awoke, they departed and traveled back to their home country a different way.
After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So our message today is all about our visitors, the Magi, the wise men, the kings. We don't know a great deal about them other than what Matthew tells us. And it's quite significant that we twig, that we log, that we realise it's Matthew who's telling us this story. It's Matthew, the person who writes for the Jewish community about the visit of the Goyim, about the visit of the non-Jews, the Gentiles, to the Christ child. It is significant because when they show up, they first go to the royal palace. Completely reasonable. They go looking to Herod, the current king of the Jews, even though he's not Jewish, he's from another nation, Iramidean, I think, I can't pronounce that right. And they ask him about the newly born king of the Jews. And he can't give them an answer. And yet his religious advisors are able to give an answer what appears to be quite quickly in Bethlehem. And so they leave Jerusalem, they leave the royal palace and they head out to Bethlehem. Now how do they get here? This message cuts, divides itself into three very easy sections. Uh, the star, the men, and the gifts. Let's start off with the star. The star has been one of those things that has caused huge amount of debate around the nativity story. Now, is it fictional? That debate's been going on for as long as Christianity. Is it possible? And there have been for at least 400 years uh, a, a broad assumption that yes, it is possible. I'm going to read you part of a book. It's from Characters Around the Cradle, and it talks about the possibility that the star was a very real thing. In late May of 7 BC, there was a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in the constellation of Pisces, a part of the heavens noted in astrological sciences as the one in which the signs noted the greatest and most noble events. A king is to be born. In October in the same year, another conjunction of the same planets took place in Pisces. In December, a third conjunction of these place, planets took place. 
It is conceivable that the Magi, Magi observed the first of these conjunctions in the east in May. If they had started their journey, they would have arrived in Jerusalem about five months later, in time for the second conjunction. If they set out from Jerusalem to Bethlehem in the evening, as it is implied, the December conjunction in 15 degrees of Pisces would be before them in the direction of Bethlehem. Something like that happened to these men. We cannot be more precise. No part of the text about the star implies that a miracle took place. It is something in the night sky that formed a pattern that their past experiences, their understandings from Babylon, including the times of Jewish occupation, made them conclude that it meant a royal, bath, but a royal birth in Judea. It was corroborated enough so that they felt they had to take out the best part of a year to go in caravan to Jerusalem and back. The star, though much debated, trust me, this isn't the only idea about what the star could have been, wasn't a group of angels mocking themselves up to look like the star. This possibly actually happened. That's an odd sentence, so let me try that again. In faith, this happened. Something in the stars registered with the star watchers, and then when they carried on, when they took the risk of journeying, it moved. It was bright enough to see with the naked eye, and it seemed to be moving towards Jerusalem and Bethlehem. It's feasible, it's reasonable. It in itself may not be a miracle, but it strikes me as being a type of miracle, a miracle of provision. In the last couple of videos when I've talked about the nativity, I've talked about the fact that um, these visits by the shepherds and angels and Elizabeth are all to do with affirmations. And these pagans, these goyim, these Gentiles, are having their uh, story affirmed. They saw a sign, they saw it again and again, as reflected in the biblical text, and they had Jewish affirmation, priestly affirmation. And so they got themselves to Bethlehem. Let's talk about these men. They are astronomers they are not astrologers they are astronomers they watch the night sky to see what the stars are doing this was a science these were perhaps some of the most educated powerful and rich men they weren't taken to winds it is perhaps interesting to know only three of them possibly showed up. Now, I say that because there's no idea how many showed up. Could have been three, could have been 300. But there are only three gifts mentioned, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And that's where we probably get three from. The Magi refers to the fact that they were wise men from the East. And the three kings, well... If you can take a year out travelling and can afford the personal bodyguards and the high status gifts, you're probably going to be people of um, some significance. Particularly if you demand, no, that's not the right word, if you claim to be able to knock on the door of another king an entrance to find his son. Let's face it, Herod, being the nasty piece of work he was, wouldn't actually open his doors for just anyone but he opened his doors for these guys so whatever term you use these are powerful wealthy educated intelligent people and they spent a year of their life traveling not in first class as we might do today but actually that rough journey of being in a caravan across deserts down the uh, silk roads with all the dangers of 
thieves and um, bandits, with all the um, un discomforts of living uh, either in tents or perhaps in, um, how can I say, less than reputable uh, inns along the way. They give up the luxury and the comfort of their homes and they come. Maybe these people are of Jewish descent. Maybe <clears throat> they are the great-great-grandsons of people who were in Jerusalem. They were there and uh, occupying forces brought them. They were actually brought by uh, the Babylonians and actually made to become like everyone else. That's why the stories of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego uh, and um, Daniel are so significant. They didn't want to become like everyone else. Maybe they are just completely and utterly non-Jewish, maybe even non-religious. Yet, yet, they knelt in worship. Now, one of the things the text makes very clear is that it's not a baby in a manger. The word used refers to that of a child. Here are these rich, powerful, tired, slightly intimidated, because remember Herod, uh, men, and they come and they bow to a child. If the star doesn't make him significant, if the shepherds doesn't make him significant, if the angels don't make him significant, the kneeling, the gifts, the worship and adoration that these three, that these individuals bring, does. And in case you're wondering what this blob is, it's a camel. They came from the east and they must have ridden a camel. I still like that tradition of having one on a horse for Arabia, one on a donkey from the, uh, uh, from the, for, the, for the Middle East and one on a camel for the Far East. I like that tradition. Because these men do represent the non-Jewish world. Remember last week we spoke about um, the prophecy given that Jesus would be a light to the world. And here is the world coming to his door, kneeling on his floor, gifting him galore, proclaiming him Lord and King. The gold, the frankincense, the myrrh, they have their own meanings, or, or meanings we've attributed to them. I quite like the prophetic attribution. Gold for a king. Frankincense for a priest. Or something to do with God, deity. And myrrh, myrrh for being human. Myrrh for death. Myrrh for what's going to come in 30 years' time. But we don't preach Easter at Christmas. We preach Christmas at Christmas. The coming of the Christ and our celebrations of it. We get our tradition of giving gifts because they gave gifts. We get our tradition because God the Father, which is the reason why this is here, gave the gift of his Son to us. The, this story, however Matthew got access to it, gives us a fulfilment of a prophecy from Isaiah. Isaiah says there will be no more kings in Israel when he's taken, when they are taken into captivity until the kings come and worship. 
Well, the kings went to Jerusalem. And they were sent out by the false king. And the real king was waiting for them. So what can we learn from all this? What does this mean for us in the year that's lying ahead? Well, it's going to be a tough year. If they can take a year to travel towards the promises that God holds, then so can we as God's adopted children. It is going to be hard work. We are moving from epidemic to endemic. This disease, this illness is going to carry on transforming. I'm hoping that this is the last of the great transformations. Because I remember someone saying that um, the more energy it makes, the more energy the disease puts into becoming more catchable, the less deadly it becomes. And that seems to be what's happening. And yet, it is still deadly. It will still kill people. People are still dying. Hospitals are still being full. And hospitals are incredibly run down. The staff in particular, not just because of winter, but because of already tra struggling for 18 months with COVID. So let's make our journeys through this year, accepting hardships and difficulties, as Paul writes, but actually just getting through it. Knowing that at the end, that perhaps next Christmas, we will be able to do this in person rather than via the internet yet again. Let's continue to bring our gifts. Gifts of skills and abilities. As we turn ourselves to the new year and the new way of doing church, we are perhaps going to become more dependent on each other than we ever have been before. Let's continue to bring our physical gifts. As we move into 2022, I need to tell you the church is in a very bad financial state. We need your giving. We need your generous giving. Not just your convenient giving, but if you haven't updated your giving in the last couple of years, can I ask you to review how much you are currently giving, give a bit more and then perhaps give a bit more again giving sacrificially because the bills haven't stopped coming in and we, but we haven't had the chance to earn the money that we used to from room rentals so we do require you to keep giving your gifts and finally let's have a bigger vision of Jesus we model him as an infant the Magi visited a child, and it uses the term house rather than manger. So as we worship in God's house, let's have a bigger vision of Jesus. He isn't just the infant in the manger. He is the child. He is the young adult. He is... The man who preaches, the rabbi who performs miracles. He is the man who becomes sacrifice. And more than that, he lives. He is resurrected from the dead and ascends to the right hand of the Father. This is no wee small God. This is a great big God who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. So let's have the faith this year to ask for immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. Let's put our effort into our prayers, into our worship, into our uh, mission, so that we can ask for big things and God can surprise us with even bigger things. Last Sunday when I was in church, struggling with the video that worked but wouldn't be edited, that wouldn't be um, distributed, uh, we got a knock on the door. Someone wanted to come and worship with us and I had to apologise and say, 
I'm terribly sorry. There's no, we're not having a service today. And that's God taking me by surprise. And I'm glad I was down here to both apologise and welcome him back on another occasion. Broke my heart a little bit. But God surprised me, even in the midst of my frustration and my uh, distraction from the fact that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. He's not a little God. He's a great big God. So, my brothers and sisters, we come to the end of our nativity set. All the characters have been discussed, all the characters have been uh, highlighted, and all we have to do now is live in the promise of the nativity. This child is meant for great and glorious things. Let's explore them together and see that presented executed, demonstrated in our lives this coming year. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you, as always, for the story of Christ's coming. During Advent, we've remembered his second coming. During Christmas time, we focus on his first coming. And now we live between those two events. He has come, and he will come again. And in between, we are the body of Christ in a watching, struggling, pain-filled world. There are so many voices in the media saying how difficult this year is going to be. Oh Lord, may we as your people be salt and light, purifying cleansing, bringing flavour, but also highlighting, identifying and showing people another, a better way. We want, O oh Lord, to demonstrate your love to this world. And Holy Spirit, we recognise we can't do it without you. Come renew us. Come revive us. Come reveal yourself to us yet again that we might see such increase in this year that the last two won't be something for us to worry about anymore. O oh Lord, as, you, as the pastor of this church, I pray your blessing, your provision, your protection on my congregation. May they know that you are with them, closer to them than their very breath. And Lord, would you hear their prayers, answer their prayers, and bring glory and honour and praise to your name through them. Lord, we can't wait to be together again to exalt you as our God and our King. Amen. Step down.
I saw Jesus 2,000 years ago. I was watching a vision. It wasn't like a dream. I was there with them. I saw he had 12 students. I saw him healing people, preaching. I hadn't read the Bible, but I saw it happening. When I woke up from the vision, I went to my neighbor, who I knew was a Christian. I told her my story, and she fell to the ground and couldn't say a word. She gave me a Bible and opened it in Matthew. It was unbelievable. What I read, that is what I had seen. In that moment, something inside me changed. The next two weeks were the best two weeks of my life. I was in a very hard situation, and my situation did not change, but I changed. My life started from that moment. I didn't tell anyone I was a Christian because I was afraid. Two years later, I moved countries. I tried every church but they refused to baptize me. It's an Islamic country. If you change from Islam to Christianity, it really costs lives. I was learning the Bible by myself and searching for eight years. Then God found me a private teacher. It was a miracle. I learned and I started telling my family. I started with my brother. He accepted Jesus. Then I told my older sister, she accepted Jesus. Most of my family are Christians now. After that, we started this small ministry. We're helping people who are in need. We do work here and in my home country. In my home country, so many people became Christians, like 1,200 people. When the neighbors saw this, they tried to harm these people. But the Christians didn't care, even if it cost them their lives. I don't know exactly what will happen, but I want to serve God. When my mom found out I was a Christian, she said, I bore you in my womb, but I wish I didn't. Choosing to follow Christ was not easy. I'm from a Muslim background, and I saw myself on one side and my parents on the other. And I wondered, am I right and they're wrong? I would have rather been wrong and them right. There was no physical violence, but they stopped talking to me. My mom and dad are really dear to me, it was really hard. When my parents stopped talking to me, I was called into full-time ministry. At first, I wanted to have both, my family and the truth. But the truth has set me free, and I cannot not speak it. My ministry is on Facebook, which is really effective for reaching people. I remain anonymous, which gives people more freedom to talk. The people I talk with are Muslims. I understand the people who message with questions because I was once there. I want to learn more so I may be ready to answer as many questions as possible. I miss my family a lot. I do long for them, but I just don't want to give up Jesus. The Lord has performed a lot of miracles for me. He takes care of me. He answers my questions. The little details, they all add up. And when I think of them all, I can't but give all I have for him.
I made a promise that I would not let any Christians live in my area, nor would I let any church nearby survive. I was born into an orthodox Hindu family. I joined an extremist Hindu group and my life's main goal was to catch Christians and beat them up. One day, I met a man and he asked me, Why are you doing this? Why are you attacking people who have not done anything to you? And he gave me a New Testament and said, Why don't you read it? I started reading the New Testament and then almost every day I wanted to read that book. I saw how, how Jesus taught his disciples to pray and I learned to pray like that. And then one day I read, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? And it hit me. After that I secretly started meeting with the Christians and learning from them. My village discovered I'd become a Christian and they tried to throw me out. They separated from me and said, we will not give you water to drink and we will not associate with you. It's, uh, it's been more than 20 years and I am still separated from some of my village, but now out of 30 families living here, 22 families have come to know Jesus. And I pray that one day it will become an entirely Christian village. I also now oversee 150 small groups in my region. I know that following the Lord is not easy. I have suffered persecution and had terrible things done to me, but in all of that, I, I have hope. The Lord Jesus came into my life, taking me from persecution to praise. He's everything to me. He is life. I pray that I will be able to complete the vision that, that God has given me to reach out to as many people as I can. Our closing prayers of intercession come from the BMS material linked with the I Will Stand campaign from earlier last year. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, we pray for the many courageous Christians around the world who are sharing good news in hard places. We pray for people who have been rejected by their families because they've chosen to follow you, O oh Lord. We pray that they experience your unconditional love that they would find strong communities that share that unconditional love and that eventually their families would accept them and they would be reconciled to them. We pray for church planters in Asia who are facing extreme persecution because of their faith. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the many, many people they are reaching with the gospel and for the new house churches that they have formed. O oh Lord, we pray for their protection. We pray for the protection of the church planters and for the new believers. And that, Lord, you would, through some miracle, soften the hearts of those who want to harm them, that they would find, instead find favour with the people and be welcomed into others' homes. Lord, we pray for isolated Christians, those that are living their faith by themselves. We ask, Lord, that you would help them find other believers who can encourage them, whether that is face to face or through social media. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would help them find ways to faithfully follow you, even when they have to live out their lives in secret. O oh God, have mercy, strengthen, support and encourage, we ask. We pray for the many BMS supported ministries reaching out to people who are hostile to the gospel. We ask for strength. We ask for wisdom. We ask, Lord, for breakthrough. 
We pray that people will have wisdom to know when to speak and when to be silent. And that, God, you will give them the right words to say in every situation. And that they would see many people come to know you, O oh Lord, through that exercise of faith and through the sacrifice that they make. And finally, Lord, we pray that through the ministries of BMS supported believers across the globe, thousands, hundreds of thousands will experience whole life transformation. We pray that as Christians living in hard places, we pray for those Christians living in hard places as they seek to share the gospel in both word and deed. That people will experience the love of Jesus for the first time. They will hear, think, dream, respond. And it will transform every area of their own lives as they see other people's lives, other people's communities, even entire societies transformed. Lord, I'm so aware as I pray these prayers that this is a reflection of exactly what the early church went through during the Roman persecutions. O oh Lord, for our friends and br brethren at BMS, we thank you for their ministry. We thank you for the difference they are making around the world. And Lord, help them to make even more of a difference uh, to those Christians that are persecuted for their faith. We thank you. We bless you. We ask that you will help us to stand with them in prayer, stand with them in their giving, in our giving and stand with them in our, in our declarations to our friends and our families about how faith in you changes the world, changes lives, and even changes us. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, please hear these prayers of intercession on behalf of BMS World Mission. Give them the money they need, the people they need, and the opportunities that they need to bring glory, honour and praise to your holy name. Amen.
But who were the Magi, and where did they come from? Some scholars think the Magi are Mesopotamian. Mesopotamia, in particular Babylon, had a great reputation for astronomy and astrology. So there was a sense in which if men were going to come from the east, they were likely to be from Mesopotamia. What would today be Iraq, a part of the world, of course, in those days with a very rich culture, Babylon, Nineveh, Sippur, and so on. They would have been men who had been taught how to read the heavens. So if the Magi were from Mesopotamia, what more can we find out about them? Their culture is long gone, and the ancient cities of Babylon have been abandoned for thousands of years, but we do have some clues. There were definitely skilled Babylonian astronomers who left behind crucial historical records which may shed light on the triple conjunction theory. Today, they can be found here in the British Museum, under the watchful gaze of Christopher Walker. Christopher, can you just tell us what these wonderful objects are? What you see now are tablets that actually we have baked for the sake of their conservation, but in antiquity they would have had wet clay, they would have flattened it out to make an oblong shape like that, and then they'd have taken their stylus and written mm. their cuneiform oh, I see. I, I didn't really say the, the fact that they're baked, that was us who did this. I didn't realise that, that's amazing. And let me ask you about the people who would have uh, written on these tablets. I mean, who were they and how accurate would they have been and why were they, why were they making these records? These were written by professional Babylonian scribes who were hired by the temple, basically for life, to sit there making astronomical observations, watching everything that happened in the sky, mm -hmm day and night, and then do the mathematical calculations month by month, year by year, to predict various astronomical events in the sky and tell you to what kind of things on Earth it might relate, okay. whether it's relating to the king or the crops or the like. So they're all, so written in Babylonian. Can you show me here which, which of these symbols are actually representing the, the planets and where they are, where they would be in the sky. In this line here, it says that Jupiter yeah. and Saturn were in Pisces. Gosh, so this is, the, this is this idea of conjunction. This is exactly this idea of conjunction. This is actually the single line that expresses that best. And it will then go on to tell you a little bit about the moon and the sun and the points at which the moon changes its position or they have an eclipse or the like. Okay, uh, what year would this one be from? These three tablets all date to the year 7 to 6 BC. Which is exactly the time we're looking for. Exactly. So that, so right there, that's it. That is the, 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 the famed triple conjunction, which could be, maybe, our, yes. our candidate. Yes. So this is real historical evidence to say at that time there was an astronomical event that was important, that people wrote down, that would have perhaps looked spectacular. It shows us that there were a group of astronomers working at Babylon who would have been able to predict the event and understand its significance, yeah. whatever that may have been to them. I mean, what do you think? Do you think that could be a contender? It's at least a possible contender. Yeah. Um, it's the only one, at least, of which we have a written record. Yeah. The problem is both that it's not quite as spectacular a conjunction as yeah. you might hope, and secondly, we have hardly any idea at all what they would have made of a conjunction. Yeah. Absolutely none of our astrological texts mention the West in anything other than the very vaguest terms. The same, to some extent, would apply to the Magi. We have no idea that seeing at this kind of planetary conjunction would have sent them running off to see King Herod in <laughs> Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah. There seems to be more, more questions than, than answers, really. I'm going to continue on my journey. I'm going to continue and, and look at the other options. But this is fascinating. It's really interesting to actually see something physical as well, something yes. concrete, as it were, written down. Thank you. OK. So we've got good, reliable historical evidence that there was this planetary conjunction and people were seeing it, observing it and writing it down. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. No mention of them being kings, no mention of how many, no mention of how they traveled. But there's a lot of clues there about them. The fact that they were in the east 
when they saw the star. That's how I choose to read it, rather than that wherever they are, they saw the star in the east. But rather that they were in the east when they saw the star, and east of Jerusalem is where the vast majority of Jews were actually living at the time of Christ. The Jews were taken into captivity in Babylon 600 years before the birth of Christ, and they never came home. Only a small contingent returned to Jerusalem. So the center of learning for the Jews was Babylon. And that's where the wise men would be, wise men like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so they will continue to be advisors to the court and will be literate, in scientific men who in Babylon would be studying astronomy for the signs of the sky and to determine when to have the holy days that are spoken of in scripture. So if you're coming to worship the king of the Jews, odds are you're Jewish. And you're reading about him in a Jewish book, which would be the Old Testament. And Isaiah in particular has a lot to say about those who come to worship the king of the Jews. And I think that Christians asked a lot of questions as this story in Matthew was told and written down. They wanted more information. Where did they come from? What were their names? How did they get there? And so they turned back to their scriptures to find those answers. And so it's in chapter 60 of Isaiah, we get a lot of indication of where those answers came from. It begins, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. So the light has arisen, the star is there. And in verse 3, And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. So immediately we say, Ah, they're Gentile kings. And then it says, A multitude of camels will cover thee. The dromedaries, and so we have camels as the way they're coming, and in particular, dromedary camels, coming from Midian and Ephah and Sheba. Well, there you have the three countries. So there are three of them. And in particular, Ephah and Midian are Middle Eastern countries. Sheba is Ethiopia. And so one of these kings must be black. They'll end up with names from the early Christians, being named Balthazar and Caspar and Melchior. Those are just honestly made up names, but they're great. They're great names. And then it describes what these Gentile kings will bring. They will bring gold and incense and show forth the praises of the Lord. So in my mind, I think, okay, we have Jewish men who are educated and literate, and they read in the scriptures that there will be a star, that's from the book of Numbers, that will arise at his birth in the prophecies of Balaam. So looking for that star, they search the heavens, and finding a star that they believe to be that star, they say, when that star arises, we got to get camels and go. And what we need to bring is gold and incense. And so they will bring gold, which is a kingly gift. They'll bring incense, probably two different kinds, frankincense and myrrh. Frankincense was offered at the temple with every offering, both on the altar of prayer and the altar of sacrifice. Myrrh was melted down and mixed in a special recipe into the anointing oil of the temple and was also used for anointing the bodies of the dead. So there's some great symbolism there. And then it goes on and talks about some other great pieces. Doves in the window. And so we'll see doves in every manger scene. It has the glory of Lebanon shall come to thee, the fir tree and the pine tree and the box to beautify the place of my sanctuary. And so most of our sanctuaries, our churches, are decorated with evergreen trees and branches because Isaiah said so. And I love the idea that these men read the scriptures and said, somebody's got to do it. Why not us? We will be the ones who will fulfill the prophecies of the Lord and we will get to meet the Messiah. And so it's it's really cool to think of those years, the, the, at least two years that they traveled and talked about what this is going to be like and then to fall on their knees 
as they meet the Christ child and his parents. What an amazing moment that must have been to pay them back for their efforts. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke are the only two Gospels which tell the story of the birth of Jesus. Notably, as we see throughout these Gospels, they each highlight different elements in the story that they think are important for their audience. For example, Matthew tends to highlight the kingship of Jesus throughout his Gospel. In Matthew chapter 2, we find the story of the Magi and the Star of Bethlehem, a story that only appears here in Matthew. For such a famous story, it only takes up 12 verses. This is a really peculiar passage that has led to a lot of questions about who the Magi were. To answer that question, let's start by looking at our source, the Gospel of Matthew. In the story as Matthew tells it, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now, Herod, who we know was already predisposed to paranoia, was predictably upset. He consulted the scribes and priests in Jerusalem, and they, citing Micah chapter 5, told him the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Herod relays this message to the Magi and, after asking about the star they saw, asks for them to tell him after they've found the Messiah, presumably so he can go worship as well. The story concludes with the Magi visiting the Christ child, giving him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and returning home by a different way, rather than reporting back to Herod. Uh, to start, let's clear up a couple of common misconceptions about this text. Now, first, we don't know how many magi are in this story. Matthew uses a plural noun, so we know he is saying there is more than one. And we often assume that there are three magi based on the fact that they give three gifts, but this is just an inference from the text. Matthew doesn't say that there are only three magi anywhere in the story. Next, there is no indication that the Magi were royalty, so the song We Three Kings, while a fantastic Christmas song, doesn't accurately describe them. But don't let that stop you from singing it and enjoying it this Christmas season. And with those questions out of the way, let's dive into the heart of the matter. What can we know about the Magi based on sources outside the Bible? We've already said that this passage in Matthew, these 12 verses, are the only place in the Bible where the story of the Magi's visit is recorded. Later writers, like the early church fathers, discuss this story, but we don't have any other records or commentaries that are close to contemporary with Matthew's account. Even so, there's plenty we can learn about the Magi from other sources, particularly other textual sources from the Greco-Roman world. Before we dive into all of this, though, I want to make an important note about historiography, or the study of the writing of history. This is when scholars look at the different ways history has been written over the years, and ancient historians wrote history differently than we write history in our day. While all history writing, both ancient and modern, involves at a fundamental level recounting events from the past, we have to understand ancient history writing needs to be critically evaluated for us to read it as we understand history. For example, Herodotus was a Greek historian and is sometimes called the father of history because he was among the first to compile sources, and even from different cultures, and organize them into a narrative that sought to answer a particular question. In his case, he wrote about the origin of the wars between Greece and Persia. But Herodotus, for all his greatness, includes a lot of details in his histories that we don't think of as historical. An extreme example comes from his work, The Histories, in which he describes fox-sized furry ants that live in India and unearth and collect gold dust. Now this is obviously something we don't take at face value when we read it today. And Herodotus said he was just reporting what travelers told him. But particularly when they write about things from other cultures, ancient sources aren't always what we would consider to be reliable narrators. This is not to denigrate ancient history writing, only to note that the conventions of what should and should not be included in history writing are different when we look at ancient history writing compared to modern history writing. So when we look at the Magi, we have two things we can consider. First is who they actually were, and we can do this through looking at archaeology and historical sources. 
but we can also look at how the Magi were understood in the Greco-Roman world and the important rhetorical functions they often play when they appear. What can we know about the Magi on both of these fronts? First, the Greek word magus comes from a Persian word magu. When magus, the Greek word, is used, <clears throat> it generally has one of two meanings. It's either a magician, or more accurately, some kind of ritual specialist, or it is referring to the hereditary priests of the Zoroastrian religion, which was centered in modern Iran. During Matthew's day, this area was the kingdom of Parthia. Another possible identity for the Magi is a tribal group of the Medians, a people group who united politically with the Persians in the 6th century BC in what became the Achaemenid Empire. In this interpretation, Magi is an ethnic or tribal term rather than a functional or occupational term. And while this ethnic designation may have been the origin for the word Magi, most scholars now do not think that, this, that most references to Magi are used in a tribal or ethnic sense. Instead, it's a class designation, that of priests or ritual specialists. It's generally agreed that this is how Matthew uses this term. Now, these Zoroastrian priests had a well-developed theology and mythology that included expectations of a virgin-born savior called the Seoshiant. It's not entirely clear when that teaching developed within Zoroastrianism, and some suggest it began with their prophet Zoroaster, while some scholars suggest it came a little bit later. There's a lot we could get into here, but we will save that for a future video. It's noteworthy that this Zoroastrian belief aligns so closely with the nature of Jesus' birth as told by Matthew and Luke. Now, if we're going to look at a few images, we can see here a few depictions of Zoroastrian priests or ritualists from sites mostly in modern Iran and Iraq. At the site of Persepolis in modern Iran, which was one of the capitals of the Achaemenid Empire, we find a large structure often called the Apadana. This site has incredible reliefs and depictions of people and objects from around the Persian Empire. Here, on the northern stairs of the Apadana, we can see the people approaching the Achaemenid king. Behind the king, here, this figure might be identified as a magi or a priest. He is part of the imperial court and is very close to the king. Now, unfortunately, we are missing the top part of his hat, which is significant because oftentimes things like status or ethnicity are indicated by, among other things, an individual's appearance like their clothes and headgear. For example, here we see a group of Medians, all with the same headgear. And here we see a group of Syrians. These are all clearly meant to be seen as different people. So when we see the courtiers with the king, how each person is represented will help us understand who they were, and in this case, a magi. Next, in what is now modern Iraq, there are a collection of tombs carved into a mountain. Inside one of these tombs, we see several carved reliefs. This tomb is of particular interest to us. So in this room, we can see several images that are likely representations of Ahura Mazda the benevolent deity of Zoroastrianism. Here we can see two ionic style pilasters flanking the entrance of the tomb and a scene between them. This scene shows two figures standing beside an altar. The half circle on the altar may represent a fire. The two figures flanking the fire are wearing typical Median headgear and are holding bows and raising their hands in a gesture of reverence or blessing. If this is in fact a fire on an altar, this may be a depiction of a Zoroastrian ritual, and the depictions of Ahura Mazda in the tomb support this. The figures are even wearing a kind of veil over their faces, and this kind of veil was worn over the face of magi and Zoroastrian priests so as to not contaminate the sacred fire with the breath of the magi. We can see something similar in this statue. This is actually from China and dates to the Tang Dynasty. While some suggest it is a Central Asian man riding a camel, others have suggested this is a Central Asian Zoroastrian priest who is feeding the sacred flame. There are a lot of unusual things about this figure, so the identity of who this person is is not generally agreed upon. The idea that this is a magi is one of several more or less equally plausible interpretations. We can be certain, however, that there were Zoroastrian priests in Central Asia. This clay and alabaster statue fragment, dating to the 2nd or 3rd century BC, depicts a Bactrian man recognized as such by his hat, who is a Zoroastrian priest. Now going back to the tomb reliefs, we may suggest that these are also magi who are tending the sacred flame. And this scene is of one or two magi attending the sacred flame is recognized elsewhere. And we can see here a few drawings of those scenes. While we have numerous depictions of magi in Persian and Central Asian archaeological sites, there are also depictions of magi, or at least Zoroastrian priests, in Greco-Roman literature. In Greco-Roman literature, magi were understood in particular ways that don't necessarily align with how we see them depicted in archaeology. One noteworthy example is that in Greco-Roman literature, 
Magi were experts on royal matters at Persian-style courts. Obviously, this applies to the Persian and Parthian courts, but also to kingdoms like Pontus in modern Turkey and Armenia. In these courts, the Magi advised the king based on their knowledge of ritual and their capacity as priests. They were also considered kingmakers. They exhibit specialist knowledge about all things royal, including, and especially, the future of the throne. Herodotus, for example, recounts a story about the Median king Astyages, who had a dream which was interpreted by Magi in his court. They interpreted the dream and told Astyages that a young child would replace him as king. As the story unfolds, this child becomes the Persian king Cyrus the Great. The historian Plutarch tells how on the night Alexander the Great was born, the great temple of Artemis in Ephesus, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, was burned to the ground. Since Ephesus was part of the Persian Empire at the time, the Magi were naturally nearby and concerned about what this could portend. They interpreted the sign as signifying the birth of a great king who would come and take over Asia. A Roman historian recounts Magi greeting Alexander the Great in Babylon with burnt, with burnt frankincense to recognize him as the foretold king. We see a pattern then in these Greek and Roman stories that the Magi can interpret signs and see the future, and they often foretell the coming of new and great kings. Now keep in mind that these are all Greco-Roman sources, not Eastern sources, so we may not want to take them as what we would consider historical. They do, however, help us see how Greco-Roman authors and their audiences understood Magi. Now, a final way of looking at the Magi is as Hellenized astrologers, which is the way most modern scholars view them. Magi are considered to be astrologers because one way of reading the future in the ancient world was through watching the stars. We should note that in the ancient world, the distinction between astrology and astronomy as we know it didn't exist. To study the stars was to know and understand how they shaped events in our world. The center of these astrological studies in the ancient world was in Mesopotamia, particularly Babylon. The Magi were Persian priests, not exactly Mesopotamia, but nearby. In Greco-Roman sources, though, this distinction wasn't always made, so as wise men and sages from the East, they were naturally seen as practitioners of astrology. Again, keep in mind that ancient sources are not always the most accurate about the intricacies and nuances of foreign lands. Even now, we have difficulty sometimes understanding cross-cultural interactions. Nevertheless, many scholars today understand the Magi as practitioners of what they call Hellenized astrology, which is a mixture of Mesopotamia's sophisticated astrological tradition and the Greek astrological tradition introduced to Mesopotamia via Alexander the Great's conquest. Again, Herodotus tells a story of the Persian king Xerxes witnessing a solar eclipse, and he calls on the Magi and their capacity as astrologers to interpret its significance. They erroneously say that the sun had set on the Greeks. So all of this adds up to show us that for Matthew, if anyone would notice an astrological sign signaling king, it would have been the Magi. Examining the background of this text helps us understand that Matthew is writing within a wider Greco-Roman historiographical tradition. Matthew, like all ancient historians, is writing from a particular point of view and with a particular purpose, to convince his readers that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel and that his arrival has ushered in a new age in which membership in God's people is available to all people through Jesus. The stories Matthew tells about Jesus and the details he includes all serve to drive home this central point. Matthew doesn't want to just convey facts, as we would call them, about Jesus. He wants to help us understand why Jesus is so important. The inclusion of the Magi's visit in Matthew's Gospel is just one example of Matthew's rhetorical technique throughout his Gospel. The Magi are significant because in the ancient Near East they were considered both kingmakers and astrologers. Matthew is showing us that these men are the right ones to recognize Jesus as king, and their association as kingmakers makes their visit to Jesus one of royal significance. In their astrological studies, Magi also interpret signs around regime change. So their visit, first to Herod to inquire about a newborn king, then to Jesus to pay him homage and offer gifts fit for royalty, tells us right at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel that in Jesus, the powers of the world have lost power and a new kingdom has been ushered in through Jesus' death and resurrection. Now finally, it's significant that these Magi recognize who Jesus is as outsiders on God's history with the Jewish people. 
From afar, they understand who Jesus is. But those who are part of God's people, Herod, the chief priests, the scribes, do not. This is another signal from Matthew, early in his gospel, that Jesus will be rejected by his own people, but that he can be received by all people who believe he is the Messiah. This is especially significant because we think Matthew's gospel is particularly written for a first century Jewish audience. It also may be a commentary on the ambivalence of many first century Jews about the true Jewishness of Herod, but that's a topic for another video. There is, however, a larger interpretive problem that we've raised in this video. What if the visit of the Magi isn't an historical event, but simply a plot point that Matthew adds to his narrative? Should that shake our faith in Jesus? Does our faith hinge on every detail of the gospel as being historically accurate? Well, as a pastor, I want to assure you that we can still place our faith in Jesus, even if we aren't sure about every detail of his life. And on a smaller scale, there are differences in the details of many stories we see shared in the four Gospels. And these small differences simply reflect the fact that the Gospel writers were drawing on oral traditions about Jesus that existed long before the Gospels were written down. The details may have been fuzzy or different from community to community, but the heart of the stories is the same. The visit of the Magi, however, could pose a larger problem. It's an entire story that has become a beloved part of our Christmas traditions, and it seems like we should be able to answer a simple question about it. Did it happen, or did it not? But the answer is, there's really no way for us to know. None of us were there at the birth of Jesus. Matthew wasn't there either. If the Magi's visit did happen, Matthew probably only had one source for it, Jesus' mother Mary. Now, if it didn't happen, that means Matthew is drawing on the culture and traditions of the world around him to convey something important about Jesus by choosing to include these particular details. So, where does that leave us? Well, here's what I want to propose. What's most important about the Magi's visit is the things Matthew wants to communicate to us about Jesus. And those things don't change based on whether or not the visit of the Magi was an historical event. The things Matthew wants to communicate to us about Jesus' kingship, his cosmic significance, his revolutionary life are true. And what Matthew is telling us through this little story is true, even if it's not historical. The Lordship of Jesus, the way he upended the powers of this world and established a new kingdom that's available to us, isn't based on this story about his birth. It's based on his life, death, and resurrection, events that happened in history and that transcend history. When we read backwards from Jesus' death and resurrection to the infancy narratives, we see that what Matthew is trying to communicate to us through the visit of the Magi is true because of who we know the risen Jesus to be.